Uh, we have an interview format uh, for our final presentation. Uh, two folks will be on stage. One is Dan Doktoroff. Uh, he is a member of the University of Chicago Board of Trustees. Uh, he was president and chief executive officer of Bloomberg, the leading provider of news and information to the global financial community until December of 2014. Um, prior to joining Bloomberg, Dan served as deputy mayor for economic development and rebuilding for the city of New York. Dan, as I said, is a member of the Board of Trustees of the University of Chicago. He's also on the board of the World Resources Institute and Human Rights First. He is the uh, founder of Target ALS, which raises funds for and has established a new model of collaboration to, to advance ALS research. He's also a founder and chairman of Culture Shed, an innovative new cultural institution at Hudson Yards uh, in Manhattan. And now today, who will be interviewing Dan, you might ask? Uh, today we have Ray Suarez, who will be joining us to conduct the interview. And as many of you know, Ray is the permanent host of Al Jazeera's America's Daily program, Inside Story. So without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Dan and Ray. Are you used to uh, people introducing you as the former head of Bloomberg yet? Uh, you know, I'm kind of enjoying it, actually. But yes, yes. Because when I was trying to figure out where to start, that was leaping out at me because very few people leave at the top of their game when there's still a long time left to go in the race. So I'm, I'm really interested in why leave Bloomberg now. Well, the very simple answer is, is Mike Bloomberg decided he needed something to do. <laughs> and he decided that he really wanted to get back involved in the company. And uh, just, just to be very clear, Mike and I are really close. You know, I've been, worked with him, for him, for 13 years, both as deputy mayor and then running the company. And you know, for, for the entire time, he said, you know, I'm not going to come back. I'm not going to come back. I don't want to come back. So he leaves office and um, realizes that you know, for him, sort of philanthropy is not a, a full-time thing. And so he started spending more time at the company. And this is all, by the way, I'm not telling any secret. We, we talked about this very publicly when I decided I was going to leave. And you know, Mike at the company, um, is kind of like God. Uh, he, he literally, you know... Is this a comparison that makes him uncomfortable? <laughs> we, we, we've discussed it, and he's sort of flattered by it. And, uh, but, but in any event, no, he seriously is. He is, you know, he created the universe, and he proclaimed the Ten, ten Commandments, and then he vanished. Um, and then he came back, and... <laughs> When God comes back, things change. And you know, for me, it was just going to be a less interesting job because you know, no matter how hard he tried um, to say, yeah, you run the company, you run the company, you know, he raises an eyebrow and 100 people start running in you know, whatever direction he winked. And um, it just was not going to be as much fun for me. So I finally, at one point he came to me and he said, you know, maybe the right answer is for me not to be here at all. And I said, you know, Mike, I don't think that is the right answer. This is your company. It's got your name on it. You ought to get out of it at this stage of your life what you want to get out of it. But it doesn't make it satisfying for me. And so he said, no, 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 you know, I'll try harder, I'll try harder. And it just didn't work for me. So I finally went to him and I said, look, you know, I love you. You know, I'm the most loyal person in the world, but at this stage of my life, you know, where I have, as you say, lots of time left, it's not the way I want to spend my time. So we were, it was, you know, a little sad uh, for both of us. Uh, I think he felt a little guilty because uh, he changed his mind, but it's the right thing for both of us. Is this a lull until you climb onto the bridge somewhere else? Or will philanthropy, which you said wasn't enough for him, be enough for you? I, I think there'll be a, another main act. I mean, I like doing lots of different things. Um, you know, I would like to innovate sort of in the cultural sphere and the, now in the uh, biomedical area. Um, I'm involved in a bunch of other things, including, importantly, Chicago. But I think there'll be one main thing that I, I do, and I've already been approached about 
um, a number of things. Um, and I have sort of an unusual background because you know, I've led, built and led an investment firm, um, not-for-profits, uh, corporation, which I led and build, and then also been in government. So you know, I can go in lots of different directions, but I'm sure there'll be one, one big one that I focus on. Well, one of the things that really made me uh, happy to get this assignment when the organizers of this conference called is that you were deputy mayor of the city at an interesting time. I mean, it's always an interesting time to be a deputy mayor of New York, but in the post 9-11 era, there were a lot of questions about the future of Manhattan, the future of the outer boroughs, the direction development should take in New York City, and as someone who has looked at this for a living in my capacity as a reporter, I've watched with a kind of growing dismay about American cities as we turn from a can-do society that built a great many fabulous things in the 20th century to something more like a can't-do society, where in more and more places, people can tell you all the reasons why some necessary and transformative project can't be built. I'm, I'm actually much more of an optimist based on our own experiences. Um, you know, as you pointed out, we, we came into office, for those of you who, who remember, at a, unusual, a terrible time, actually. So Mike Bloomberg was elected mayor about, uh, it's about two months after 9-11, and we took office about three and a half months after 9-11, and City Hall is in Lower Manhattan. On my first day, I walked over to Ground Zero, which I had not been to before taking the job, and um, the fires were still smoldering at Ground Zero, so, you know, this was a emotional catastrophe, it was a physical catastrophe, and it was a financial catastrophe. And as you pointed out, Ray, people really questioned the very notion of cities, you know, and were they threatened? And was 9-11 an actual sort of real, kind of went right to the heart of the question, of the issue that makes New York unique, which is its openness, right? Would you have to start closing down. And so it was a really uncertain time. We actually viewed it somewhat differently. We actually saw 9-11 um, as a galvanizing force, that people in New York really wanted to rebuild the city and make it greater than it had been before, um, starting, by the way, in lower Manhattan. And that was the approach that we took. And we developed a plan to literally transform the face of New York. And I think, for the most part, that happened. I mean, you can look in Lower Manhattan. Before 9-11, you know, despite the nostalgia had for the, people have for the World Trade Center site, it was a sort of disaster as an urban planning um, project. It cut off Lower Manhattan in multiple ways. Um, Lower Manhattan itself, there was no activity after 6 o'clock when the office workers left. Um, and today, if you go down there, I mean, it's literally being completely rebuilt. The number of residents in Lower Manhattan is quadrupled. It's filled with stores, and it's filled with, um, uh, it's filled with restaurants. Um, there's a much more diverse mix of employers down there. The World Trade Center site itself, personally, I think, is magnificent, not particularly now that they've opened up the memorial, so it's much more porous. Um, and, um, but the rest of the city, I think we rezoned, replanned 40% of the city. And I think the, the, essential, um, the essential observation or insight we had was that, you know, we were still suffering in many ways from the classic debate between Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs. You know, between big projects and sort of the planning on the streets. And that had paralyzed the city for 40 years. Meanwhile, the employment base of the city was changing dramatically. You know, in 1970, there were 700,000 manufacturing jobs. When we started, you know, there were 100,000 or so, leaving huge swaths of 
of land in, in really prime areas, particularly along the waterfront on the west side of Manhattan, you know, former military bases or Coast Guard bases or railroad, um, railroad depots that just were in great locations but no one had ever touched. And our, our charge, we felt, was to really prepare New York for the 21st century, that as a city we're in a competitive environment with other cities around the world and that we were going to try and really in one fell swoop um, change a lot of that. And you know, people can debate whether some of this was good or bad, but there is no question it's pretty, pretty dramatically different now. Some great histories are going to be written of the time after 9-11 and the battles around Lower Manhattan, maybe when all the combatants are in their dotage and no longer in the white heat of the fight. But come on, you had to have had some terrible days in discussing how to redevelop an area that you could not get your mitts on. There were legal barriers pre preventing the city of New York from having a big say about what happened in a multi-acre site where one of the great disasters in modern American history happened. Yeah, it, look, it, it, I have to, it was awful at times. Um, you know, think about kind of and I'll just focus on the uh, ground zero itself. 16 acres where 10 million square feet of office space had been destroyed, where 2,800 people had lost their lives, um, where the transportation infrastructure, even before 9-11, needed dramatic upgrading, and then it was largely destroyed. Um, and so think about the emotion and the physical complexity, particularly after 9-11, where the security issues um, were dramatically um, exacerbated. Um, and you're cramming all that emotion, all that complexity into one site with, by the way, the federal government involved, the state government involved with probably 10 different agencies of the state, um, the Port Authority, which owned the site, private landowner who had, or leaseholder who had the lease for the site, literally had entered into that lease about two months before 9-11. You had, had another 98 years to run. We had another 98 years to run. You had, you know, all the neighbors, both residents, small businesses, big businesses. I mean, it was, it was incredibly complicated. And, you know, people didn't all see it the same way. And it was very frustrating. But at the end of the day, we actually worked through it. And the city, actually, which didn't control the site, um, used, I think, every piece of leverage we had um, in order to exert maximum influence. And our approach was to intervene at strategic points in the process. At very early on, um, there were plans designed by the state and the, the, the leaseholders that were ugly. They were terrible. We intervened at that point. There was a complete knot that had developed after about three years over insurance and the pace of rebuilding. We actually took the lead. We secretly conspired with the state of New Jersey, which controlled half of the Port Authority. We built financial models. We finally forced the governor of New York um, to make an ultimatum to Larry Silverstein, who, by the way, I'm a big fan of. Um, and it broke the knot, which allowed the buildings to go ahead. The memorial was stalled. Mike Bloomberg stepped in. He volunteered to be the chairman of the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. He raised $700 million. We worked out all the com complex um, infrastructure issues and financial issues involved in it, and the memorial ended up getting built. So, you know, look, here we are, it's now 13 years later, pretty much the whole site is being rebuilt or has been rebuilt, and I said, I think it speaks for itself. It is a, the memorial itself, I think, is magnificent. The museum is, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's devastatingly powerful. Um, and the integration of the site itself with the rest of Lower Manhattan 
which is emerging as we had always hoped, and this is where the city really took the lead as sort of this 24-hour live, work, visit community is actually becoming that. So yeah, it was, it was difficult. Nothing in government is ever easy. Um, it, it's hard, everything's hard because there are all these different constituencies with different objectives fighting over, you know, whether it's a plot of land or a policy or a combination of the two. And so you have to navigate through all that complexity. And it's not easy. And by the way, we came into government, certainly Mike and I and a lot of our colleagues, including, by the way, um, the, the uh, chairman of University of Chicago Board of Trustees, Andy Elper, who quit his job to work at, as a partner at Goldman Sachs to work for $1 a year um, for, um, for New York City to help it recover after 9-11. You know, none of us came in with any experience in government. So, and I think in reality, that turned out to be an asset. <laughs> it, it really did. Well, you began this passage of the conversation by noting that you're an optimist. And that's great. But we don't even pick some of the low-hanging fruit in urban development. We don't even do some of the easy things. Like extending the seven train to Jersey which would have been good for New Jersey and great for New York. Didn't happen. When I moved to Chicago, the, we the week the Bears won the Super Bowl in 1986, one of the first stories I did as a reporter there was about the new plan to build high-speed rail from St. Louis to Chicago and from Chicago to Minneapolis. Not a hundred yards of that rail has been laid. There's track bed in Brooklyn, for which there are beautiful drawings, ambitious plans, and fairly low cost, considering all the variables, fairly low cost plans that could revitalize what was built for industry for people in a city that sometimes is choking on its need to move people around from place to place. It's really hard to do even yeah. the yeah. easy things. You know what it is, but on the other hand, first of all, a lot of those big plans, and no one is a bigger advocate of big plans than I am, are often stupid big plans. So, you know, the, the notion of high-speed rail from Chicago to St. Louis, yeah, I'm not sure that ever is justified by the cost of it. It's not just about not doing it. It's about sometimes those things don't make sense. And I think it's also unfair. I mean, you look at Chicago. I mean, Chicago is a remarkably different city than it was when, when you um, got there in 1986. New York, you talk about, yep, there's a line in Brooklyn, which someday I think somebody will probably get to. But you know what? 12 years ago, there was a line that's uh, old abandoned freight line that snaked up the west side of Manhattan that concrete was falling from, um, that everybody said ought to be torn down. Um, and out of that actually became the High Line, which is probably the, one of the great public spaces developed um, anywhere in the last generation. In fact, the High Line last year was the ninth most Instagram place on earth. I mean, literally <laughs> five million people walked on it, and when we came into office, it was one court decision away from being torn down. On the west side of Manhattan, just, to the, just where the High Line begins to curve around those rail yards, Right now, if you were to go there, those rail yards are being decked over. Literally, a big platform is being built over them. And on the two platforms that will be constructed will be roughly 20 million square feet of space, 9 million of which, which by the way, include three office buildings, two apartment buildings, a major cultural center, a million square feet of retail, including the first Neiman Marcus in New York, um, and lots of open space, and a school. Um, that's all, that, that nine million square feet be under construction by next year. The subway, by the way, that number seven line that you just mentioned, the number seven line is gonna open up going from Times Square to that area, which is making all this possible uh, this year and within the next couple of months. And you know what, someday perhaps, you know, New York and New Jersey will get together and agree to extend it either further south or into New Jersey. But the truth is, is that, you know, 
good ideas can happen. They require leadership, particularly leadership that's going to look well into the future. It requires will, often in an era of constrained financial resources. It requires um, really creative financing, this number seven line. So, you know, the M, for those of you who don't live in New York, even for those of you who do, the MTA is a creature of the state. Um, and it can be an evil organization. <laughs> um, but they have all sorts of competing priorities and things. And for the city, our priority was to get the number seven extended to the west side so we could open it up. And we didn't want to get into debates with the now proven corrupt uh, speaker of the assembly who wanted to spend <laughs> the Second Avenue subway all the way to lower Manhattan. We didn't want to compete with that. So we said, you know what, we're going to pay for it ourselves. Well, we didn't have the money after 9-11 to pay for it ourselves. You know what we did? We convinced a bunch of bondholders to actually go ahead and loan us the money, and they'd only get repaid out of the, of the incremental tax revenues generated out of the area. So I said, I'm an optimist, but I'm an optimist where you have great leadership who's willing to take, and I'm not referring to me, I was really referring to the mayor, you have, you know, who's willing to take real risk, be really creative, not care um, so much about whether he or she is going to be reelected. In my six years in City Hall, the number of times that as we were discussing a policy or a position or strategy that the re-election chances of Mike Bloomberg actually came into the discussion, and I'm being very serious about this, I said you can love him or hate him, but the number of times that that actually came into any consideration in my six years was zero. Zero. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, you know, an amazing... Well, he had a job to go back to, as it turned out. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. The, uh, <laughs> No, but, but that's remarkable, right? And so I'm just saying you, the real failure I think that you're pointing to is not one of process or procedure or anything like that. It's usually one of leadership. And, uh, um, you know, that is probably too rare. And I, I don't want to minimize the challenge of making these kinds of decisions, and I don't want to make it sound simpler than it is. I realize it's, it's really hard to thread the needle and often when in the lights of current circumstances you think you're doing exactly the right thing, history may have another verdict. You know, it seemed like a good idea when you were developing Riverside Drive to put the highway next to the water and separate the park from the water by a highway. That was a 1940s theory about how you develop land like that. It's a stupid idea, as it turns out, and undoing it takes a century. No, it actually, it doesn't. And right now, um, if you were to go, there's this whole big development between 70, like 60th Street and 72nd Street, unbeknownst to anybody, um, underneath that development is a tunnel, okay, that has been built for the exact um, for the exact purpose that you've described. It won't take 100 years. It might take 20 for the whole thing to get built out. And then for relatively little money, you'll be able to tear down the highway and divert it into that tunnel. But that's happening. So you're right. I mean, people do make mistakes. You know, we, we do the best we can with the information we have at the time. And not everybody, I'm sure other than everyone in this room, is perfect in all of their decision making, <laughs> but you know there's an opportunity to rethink things over time. And you know again, it takes foresight. It takes spending some extra money to say, you know what, we're going to build that tunnel now under the park, so that at some point in the future, when we're all done with, you know, with that development, that we can divert it. And that will happen someday. You noted that both New York City and Chicago are very different places than they were in the past. One thing the two places have in common in the most recent decade is that they weren't picked as the site for the Summer Olympics. Uh, New York City in 2012, Chicago in 2016. But as you watch this process, more and more countries are getting into the game 
that have authoritarian governments, and it seems, for some of them, like Almaty uh, vying for the Winter Olympics, that there's no ceiling on the amount of money that they can spend, while in democracies, people who actually get elected by taxpayers are pulling themselves out of the race. And half a dozen cities over the last two cycles have pulled themselves out of consideration for either the winter or the summer games. Is it tougher? Are these international athletic festivals becoming just really daunting for democracies to put on? I, I don't think so. And I think if you look at, you know, let's go back over the last, you know, from 2012, we may have lost for 2012, but we lost to London. You know, UK is a democracy. Chicago lost to Rio. Brazil is a democracy. Flawed one, perhaps, but a democracy. Um, 2020, it's going to be in Tokyo. Tokyo is a democracy. Um, there were a lot of cities competing in the United States to be the U.S. candidate city for 2024. Boston will be the candidate. The reason, by the way, both Chicago and New York lost more than anything else was because of internal Olympic politics and the International Olympic Committee hated the United States Olympic Committee. I mean, really, they hated each other. And the International Olympic Committee has the tickets, or you know, they hold the cards, and they chose basically to punish both of us because of that poisonous relationship. That, by the way, is largely cleared away, and I think there's a pretty good chance you will see a U.S. city win again. The Winter Olympics, um, it's a little bit different. Um, it's a little bit different um, in part because there just aren't that many places in the world that can host a Winter Olympics. You know, there's not 200 countries that compete in the Winter Olympics. There's 40-something that compete. Um, and, you know, they like to spread it around. And, yes, it, like in the case of Sochi for the last time for 2014, you know, you had an authoritarian government who wanted to use it as showcase, just as sometimes you do for the Summer Olympics. But, you know, I don't think it's fair to say that it's just like, you know, uh, authoritarian governments who can do this anymore. And I also think that the way in which you do it um, is really a function of your city and the needs that you have. We saw in New York the Olympics more than anything else as a catalyst to getting things done that we otherwise wouldn't be able to generate the political will or money to do. And that's the way we structured our bid, which originated before I or Mike Bloomberg came into office. I was the one who started the Olympic bid, and that's what led me to let Mike Bloomberg, and that's what led me to City Hall. Um, but the whole idea behind it was the Olympics and even bidding for the Olympics are unique in a city's life for one reason, and that is they occur on a deadline, right? Nothing else ever in a city occurs on a deadline. And, and it's just like you are, you invite people over to your house, you clean it up because you don't want them to think you live like a slob. And that's what, <laughs> that's what cities do. And that's what we did in New York. So if you go back and you look at our original plans to host the Olympics, which were all developed before we came into City Hall, included redoing the west side of Manhattan, do redoing the High Line, focusing on the waterfront in Brooklyn and Queens, focusing on, low, on downtown Brooklyn, on Flushing in Queens and Harlem, the South Bronx, Coney Island. Those were the eight core areas of our plan. We decided that we would try and get plans done for all of them before we were either selected or rejected in 2005. And that's what we did. So, you know, I'm a huge advocate of cities bidding for the Olympics if what they're going to do is use them at, for that catalytic effect. If all you're going to do is think about it as sort of the 17-day festival way out into the future, less good idea. It, you got to think of it as how you're going to use that deadline, either bidding or winning, uh, hosting, in order to make your city better. And I think that's what we've done. And that's what a number of cities have done. London is dramatically changed as a result of hosting the Olympics. Some cities do a terrible job. 
Athens did an awful job because they built a bunch of white elephants, part of their systematic process of bankrupting the country. But it doesn't have to be that way. And I don't think Chicago would have been that way either. I think Chicago was pretty thoughtful, but they didn't get the kind of benefit out of it that we did because said we saw it as the opportunity, in part fused by that spirit after 9-11 to really rethink the city. One thing that didn't happen, uh, you didn't manage to lure one of New Jersey's two football teams <laughs> to New York, but that may not be such a big loss looking at the way they play. Um, <laughs> but I think a case might be made that getting ready for it and not getting it still got a lot of the benefits to New York City because it, in one thing, it precipitated the first rezoning of vast parts of the city. And I was surprised to find this out. Since 1961. Right. So places that had the same zoning status, for instance, in coastal Brooklyn, uh, everything west of the line with uh, Queens, uh, for the first time in 50 years. And now, where, where is it zooming now in redevelopment right. and, and development? No, I, I, I do think that said, the Olympics act, the Olympic bid asked, acted as a catalyst to making all that happen. Um, that said, I still think um, the, having the Olympics here would have been a great thing for New York. Uh, it said, I see us as in a global competition with other cities around the world, and I see New York as being just a different kind of place. I see it as, this is my own view, and people will disagree, and I know it's highly imperfect and everything, but I really see as the world gets closer together, you know, through technology, ability to move more easily from place to place, that New York still is sort of a microcosm of what we hope the world will be. You know, here you have a city where 40% of the people were born outside of America, where 65% of the people here were either born outside of America or have one parent who was born outside of America. Um, it's now the safest big city, but it's a place where generally people really get along. And it is the most, I think, open place in the world. My favorite story ever, we were bidding for the Olympics, and I was talking about New York to the president of a bank in Japan. He said, you know why he'd, been the, he'd run his bank's branches in London and Paris and Sydney, I don't know where else, and New York. He said, you know why New York is my favorite city in the world? I said, no. He said, you're going to laugh. I said, what? He said, because New York's the only city, remember this is a Japanese guy, New York is the only city in the world where when I walk down the street, people ask me for directions. <laughs> And it's funny, but it's really profound, because what it means is that this is the place, no matter what you look like, no matter what you're wearing, people just assume you're from here. <laughs> and that's an incredible asset. And I always believe that hosting the Olympics would be the expression um, of that, I, the ultimate expression of that ethos. And that's, in fact, how I thought about having the Olympics here back in, like, 1994 when the World Cup was in the United States. Somebody dragged me out to the semifinal game out at the Meadowlands in New Jersey, and I was dreading it. It was 100 degrees. The traffic getting out there was miserable. And we walk in the stadium. It's the most remarkable thing I've ever seen. You know, the stands are filled with Italian-Americans and Bulgarian-Americans, you know, with their faces painted, waving flags. You couldn't sit down the entire match. And I thought to myself, you know, the amazing thing about New York is you could play that game with any two countries in the world and the feeling would be exactly the same. So why shouldn't the most international event be in the world's most international city? So I think it would have been great. It wasn't. We got a lot out of it anyway, and life goes on. You know, it's interesting. It's a lagging indicator. When a city turns around, it takes a little while for people to actually believe it. You could run a two-day film festival, morning, noon, and night, of dystopian New York films, Summer of Sam, The Warriors, and on and on and on, where New York is a setting, Escape from New York, uh, where, where New York is a setting for everybody's vilest nightmares about what urban living in the United States is like. But that would be utterly fictional. 
about today's New York, and I'm not sure Americans believe it yet. You know, I think, I think people do increasingly. So, but but you, you highlight, I think, a really important point, which is you can't just let um, others define your image for you. That, again, if you think of a city in part as a product, you have to market your product. And we felt very strongly that that was a critical part of our job. And that was especially important after 9-11, where everybody thought that like all of New York was destroyed, practically. In fact, you know, we started hosting events that defied people's expectation about New York. Literally four days before the first anniversary of 9-11, we had, in partnership with the National Football League, a huge concert in Times Square. Um, with 500,000 people attending, you know, smiling, having a great time. The whole purpose of it was to send messages to the rest of the country that New York was open, that it was fun, that it was interesting. Two years after that, um, we had the Republican Convention in New York. Now, there is not a less likely place to have the Republican <laughs> Convention yeah. than in New York. This is a city that is five to one Democratic. Okay, we hosted the convention here because we were convinced that if we drew 4,000 people from every part of the country, trailed by 15,000 members of the media who saw that New York actually was like great, it was fun, it was even fun for Republicans from Wyoming, <laughs> that that would have a profound impact on our image. And you know what's interesting is that when we came into office in 2002, there were 35 million visitors to New York City. In 2014, there were 56 million visitors to New York City. The number of hotel rooms went from 55,000 to 105,000. And on average, each one of those rooms generates two jobs. And those are jobs typically for people on the first or second run of the economic ladder in America and in New York. And so you got to work hard because you're right. People are going to define you. Those, those perceptions lag. Um, you know, most people probably don't know that in 1992, 2,100 people were murdered in this city. Last year, it was 300. You know, comparing to Chicago, it was dramatically less than Chicago, despite the fact, not being critical, but despite the fact, and I'm going to start talking positively about Chicago, but because I think what's happening in Chicago is also incredibly impressive, but despite the fact Chicago's three times the size of New York. So, you know, you have to tell the story, and um, I think, you know, if you look at the University of Chicago, Chicago, University of Chicago has also been a place where perceptions have lagged, um, where there has been more progress at the University of Chicago over the last certainly six or seven years than any other university in America. I was just with the number two guy at Columbia, who's a very good friend the other day, he said, the academic, the social, the overall success story in American higher education over the last decade is University of Chicago. And Chicago is very, University of Chicago is very fortunate that it has an administration that is really focused on telling the story as it is, which has dramatically changed the perception. That's a great opening for a confluence of two important themes when talking to you. Because, you know, it wasn't all that long ago in the life of the city that the university was threatening old Mayor Daly with leaving the south side, scouting locations in the suburbs, because life in Woodlawn, life in Oakdale, uh, life west of the campus, Washington Park and to the west, had taken a dramatic turn for the worse, and the administration was telling Daly that they that too many parents were saying they wouldn't let their kids apply to go there because it was getting too dangerous and too crazy. They turned that around. Its world around it has changed. The place, Hyde Park, has changed. You gave five 
million dollars to the law school, um, it gives me a reason to live another thousand years so I can catch up. <laughs> um, <laughs> at my current rate of giving and helped <laughs> along by inflation. Um, thank you for doing that, but that's a big vote in the future of an institution, and I want to know why you did it. Well, let me first say, so I went to law school at Chicago, um, and I was only at Chicago for two years. Um, and it was in a period that, you know, was 1981 to 83. And I actually left after my second year because my wife took a job in New York. And so I finished up here at NYU. And so, you know, I didn't have particularly strong feelings um, about the university um, or the law school um, when I was there. I felt like it was sort of unfinished for me. And I actually only went on the board because I mentioned um, Andy Elper, who is the chairman of the board of, the tru of trustees, who had done me a huge favor by coming into government, and so he asked me if I would go on the board of Chicago. And I said, really as a favor to Andy, that I would. But I didn't feel that passionate about it. And I have to tell you that um, I feel incredibly passionate about it today because I have seen what's happened there. I have never seen a university where the alignment among administration, faculty, trustees, alumni is as great as it is at Chicago. I've never seen a university where the ambition is as great um, if you look and see what happened after the financial crisis, a lot of universities, some that were, I went to Harvard, my alma mater, my kids, two of them went to Yale, retrenched. Chicago didn't retrench. Chicago very smartly kind of raised its ambitions um, in complete alignment all the way up and down the line. And you see, you know, a campus that is just thriving with new programs. I know Eric Isaacs talked about some before, the Institute for Molecular Engineering um, being maybe the most prominent example, but you could go on and on and on. New programs, new engagement for undergraduates, raising the standards for literally every graduate school. You look and see what's going to happen with the Harris School over the next several years. It's remarkable. And to be a part of that, with such a storied institution that is such a unique brand, but is modernizing it without losing its identity, is so thrilling. And so, look, I said I went to Harvard, my kids went to Yale, I went to NYU for a year, I've been totally involved with Columbia and Columbia's expansion um, in, uh, into Manhattanville, in northern Manhattan, and this is the place where I've chosen to get involved, and it is really one of the greatest experiences that, of my life. And so it's just thrilling to be a part of something where it's winning, and it's, and it's important. And the things that we are doing, particularly as we seek to engage more and more into the communities around us, I think is really groundbreaking. So it's, it's exciting to be a part of that. We'll go to questions now. Are there roving mics, fixed mics, roving mics? Raise your hand, higher roving mic man, so we can see you. There you go. Um, and you heard Mr. Doktorov talk a couple of times about his love for Mike Bloomberg. Let me tell you what Mike Bloomberg said about Dan Doktorov while the mic makes its way over. History will show that Dan Doktorov had a bigger impact on this city than virtually anybody. That's a lot of people in virtually <laughs> anybody. Takes in a, that's a very large set. You had your hand up. Yeah. So you, one thing that you had mentioned is that people are moving. Name and class? Uh, my name is Heather Blanco. I'm a JD 2008. I did all three years at Chicago. <laughs> 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 One thing you had mentioned is that people are moving from city to city and people are moving among the great cities. Um, one thing that I'm concerned about is very wealthy individuals 
moving into Manhattan and not contributing to our tax base. So people who buy very expensive apartments but then don't live here for the required number of days to pay income tax. Can you just speak to that for a little bit? Like, what's happening in the city? How are we? I think there's a relatively narrow set of buildings that where there's super wealthy that have been given temporary tax abatements. These are not permanent. They're temporary. Um, and I don't think that's the right policy. I think it does need to be adjusted. That said, I think it's also important to recognize that those buildings would not have existed otherwise. If you look in every case at sort of what was there before, the total tax revenues, as well as the construction jobs, it's a good thing for the city. I mean, you're talking about a very, very small number of people. Um, but well, I, how long are these abatements, for example? You know, well, they, they scale up. So the abatements typically last somewhere like 14 years or so. Um, and then but, they're fully on the rolls? Yeah, yeah. So it's not permanent. But I think your point is well taken. Um, now, that said, I think we want those super wealthy people here. Um, because, again, I think it creates jobs for construction workers. I think eventually those buildings pay full taxes. They spend a lot of money here. And those buildings are not displacing anybody from where they, where they have lived. You know, they're on 57th Street um, or whatever. This is not sort of this displacement impact. But, again, I think your point is the right one, which is that, you know, people ought to pay fair share of taxes. And the, one of the issues you have is that, you know, sometimes these policies are created at times when um, it's hard to get anything built. And you knew, do need to incentivize people to build anything, which creates those construction jobs and other things. And government often isn't fast enough or responsive enough to adjust to market conditions. And I think this is a case where that probably was, was. But it'll catch up eventually. So Ray, we're going to come right over here. We have a question right here. Thank you. Uh, Tim Conley Business School, uh, 1980. Um, I was wondering if um, investment of any kind in New York City would be an imprudent or um, misguided undertaking due to uh, climate change. Um, in particular, I'm thinking about uh, the effect of um, seawater uh, making its way into the foundations, which are, I presume, uh, made, made with a rebar, which corrodes, and also making its way into the various uh, other infrastructure for example, tunnels and trains. Um, and so uh, th this would uh, possibly result in the um, costs of uh, remediation uh, exceeding the benefits of uh, trying to keep the sea at bay. I, I think it's a great question. Um, you know, we, we spent a lot of effort um, on the whole question of adaptation. Um, which obviously wasn't enough given what happened with Sandy. Um, but that doesn't mean investment cannot be smart investment. Uh, you know, what has happened before Sandy and then accelerated after Sandy is a whole set of policies that I think make investment prudent. I'll give you an example of that. Um, and this actually happened before Sandy. I think everybody knows that the worst devastation after Sandy occurred in the Rockaways, right? And we've all seen the pictures of everything on fire and the devastation. Um, and it was terrible. It was truly terrible. What people probably don't know is also in the Rockaways was a brand new development that had been built obviously before Sandy, but after the new sort of adaptation-friendly code had been put in place. So that means raising the buildings, um, having infrastructure on the second floor. And these are not expensive homes. I mean, these are true sort of middle-income homes in the Rockaways. Um, they survived perfectly, okay? They were sold or rented, you know, based on whatever it cost, including the, the, the cost to make them storm ready. The problem is, is we got a lot of stuff that 
it's too hard, it's very hard to retrofit. You know, but in 2030, probably 90% of the building, that, of all the buildings that'll exist in 2030, 90% of them exist today, right? So you can't completely retrofit them. But what you can do is smart building codes. You can have different fire codes. You can mandate retrofits in certain cases. Um, you can change lots of policies. And that's basically what the city's doing. In addition to some of the other bigger infrastructure that are part of the resiliency plan. So let me follow up. I, but, but, but there's no doubt that there is risk here as a result of climate change. It's why, let me just finish, it's why the city actually created initially a sustainability plan and then followed up well before Sandy and then accelerated it after Sandy because it's a risk for a city like New York. Humane public policy uh, means not telling people they can't live where they live anymore, yet prudent long-term thinking might require that. My mother-in-law lives in Manhattan Beach. The water rose up in Sheepshead Bay. The water came in from the Atlantic. Her house was totally swamped from two directions. She was paid handsomely by various agencies, FEMA and Build It Back and all these various places, that asked for nothing in the way of retrofitting, that asked for nothing in the way of making that house re-inhabitable so that the next time this happens, it would cause less expensive damage. And I don't know if I want a, a commissar of Lower Brooklyn to march through and say, sorry, you can't live here anymore, but maybe in return for the money, there are some terms under which you can live here from now on. I don't know. Uh, I, I, look, it's a, it's a really hard question. Uh, we don't like to tell people where. This is a storm that, you know, at least theoretically, is supposed to occur every 100 years. You know, what's the cost of moving? Where do you actually move people to? I mean, the number of people in low-lying areas in the city is significant. Instead, what you focus on is um, both, you know, said adaptation in terms of creating barriers that will reduce the impact on code things that can help, if it does happen again, ameliorate the problem even before it occurs. Um, but I don't think we want to be in a position of telling people where they can live unless there's really much more significant probability of danger, which I'm not sure is the case. Yes. We're going to take two more questions. MD and PhD. Uh, I'm going to, if you don't mind, I wanted to change the topic a little bit. Uh, we're all here because we think, or many of us are here because we think that education is, is a road towards peace and betterment, and that ignorance is a way towards worsening of the world. And I know that the media play a great role in disseminating information, but they can also play a role in making things worse. And especially in the, the fight for eyeballs these days, um, among the different media, um, how much does the, the hysteria the media bring up, or the fact that Al Jazeera is the, is the, the uh, site where terrorists send their videos, or the, the difference, uh, the, the way we give publicity to, to people who create uh, terrible acts of violence here, how much does that contribute, do you think, and how much does do the do your media outlets take responsibility for some of what's going on in terms of violence? Is that question to me? <laughs> yes. I think that misplaces the causality, if you want me to give you a University of Chicago style answer. Huh. Uh, I, the idea that you know about things, therefore it causes them to happen, is a tough sell for me. Uh, and I guarantee you, if Osama bin Laden had given his videos to other media outlets, uh, they would have run them. Uh, they, he just happened to leak it through 16 various hands until it passed to Al Jazeera, which at that time was the first non-state controlled media outlet 
in the Arabic-speaking world. Uh, if you live for all your history in an atmosphere where information comes from one source and what the government wants known is what gets known, Al Jazeera um, becomes uh, the place where you go if you want to speak to the Arab world. And while, I mean, I didn't work for the company then and there was no English language service then, uh, but the idea that it's terrorist TV is just ludicrous. What it is, is TV um, bursting uh, in a uh, juvenile and then adolescent way into a, a marketplace that was only tightly and strictly controlled before and you're trying on your big boy pants every day. Would they do that today? I don't know. Uh, the people who make decisions in Arabic for the main service in Doha don't call me and they don't ask my permission. Uh, all I can control and all I can see from somebody who's worked in this business for 40 years is that information will get known and to place responsibility onto media outlets uh, is uh, caught before the horse thinking. And whenever somebody comes up to me very agitated and says, how come you're not covering X, Y, Z? No one knows this because of that. I look at them and say, well, how do you know it? And they never have a very good answer. In the current Wild West world of media, where information is gushing out of every orifice, it's really hard to keep anything a secret. And the idea that one medium or another will provide the entire information ecosystem for any audience is a really tough sell. It was a tough sell in the 1980s. It's an even tougher sell now. And actually, because he was a media executive for a long time, this might be better answered by Mr. Dothero. <laughs> We just did business and financial news. No, the, um, <laughs> look, I think um, there are certainly news organizations that are less responsible than others, and that is probably unfortunate in a perfect world, but we don't live in a perfect world, and we never have. And the cost of trying to censor in some form those imperfections is much greater than the damage that they cause by being irresponsible. I think it's also important to put the question in historical context as well. We tend to think we're living in this sort of sui generis age where, you know, there's this proliferation of information as a result of the internet and as a result there's a much greater tendency to be irresponsible. I think it's always been that way. Um, and, you know, go back and read the stories of penny newspapers during the founding days of the Republic. In New York alone, there were something like 200 newspapers printed every day that printed all sorts of scurrilous information that was brutal compared to anything that you see today. Um, and this notion that somehow we're living in this age in which either we're tamer um, or there's, you know, less kind of information, um, more information, I just think ignores kind of history. You know, we went from, said, these penny newspapers to then there was the telegraph and then there was the radio and then there was the television. By the way, in the 1960s, there were still, you know, 20 different newspapers in New York City or something like that. And then we went to cable TV or network TV, then cable TV. We're constantly getting new sources of information and we just adjust. So, you know, it's one thing that's always good to kind of complain about, but it's a problem we're going to live with and it's candidly in the democracy we have. Um, it's a problem that we happily, I think, generally live with, or at least as happily as we can. But since you brought it up, if you'd like to see whether I'm responsible or not, my show, Inside Story, <laughs> is on Monday through Friday at 11.30 Eastern. So, uh, on which we're, channel? Here we're on, in Manhattan? Well, it, it depends on where you, what your zip code is. I have an app for that if you want to check. <laughs> but, um, but please do watch Al Jazeera America. I think we're doing great work and adding to uh, a very vibrant medium. 
and uh, really giving the other guys a run for their money. So thanks for bringing it up. One more right here. I just yell it out. had the loyalty to it uh, for the 30 some odd years since uh, then. I also completed the three years there. Um, but my question is having I still been graduated from there. I, just <laughs> want to be clear. I know that. I know that. Um, and I agree with Bloomberg's analysis. Having heard you speak and what you've done, I think he's got it spot on. But uh, putting that aside, you've had a relatively unique role in, uh, in being uh, in the positions you've been in in business, philanthropy, and, um, and government. And I'm curious, having had that relatively unique vantage point, uh, what your view is as to where you can make the maximum contribution going uh, forward? It's an excellent question. Uh, I don't have that answer. Is the, I mean, I'm just really starting to process it. I've only been out of a job for about a month and a half, and I traveled for the first five weeks. So I can tell you in terms of my own personal happiness, it's traveling and having nothing to do. But I suspect, <laughs> I suspect that will not be sustainable. Um, I actually do believe in the right conditions, the place where I, you know, uh, or I think I generalize, anybody can have the single biggest impact. But I underscore has to be under the right conditions is in government. Um, you know, the amount of money that government has, um, the ability to set an example for other places um, is phenomenal. I'll never forget um, when Mike Bloomberg decided to ban smoking in restaurants and bars in New York. It was incredibly unpopular um, in New York. And by the way, this occurred about a year after, you know, a year and a half after 9-11. So people hated him for it, generally speaking. But you know, a funny thing started to happen. Um, other jurisdictions started banning smoking in restaurants and bars, and then in public places. So within a couple years, they banned smoking in restaurants and bars in Ireland, and then France, and then Russia. Um, and you know, as a philanthropist, he spends tons of money um, on fighting smoking in different places, but there was probably no single thing that he could have done um, other than, than just the act of legislation in New York that will save nearly as many lives over time as moving that effort forward to reduce people's incentives to smoke. So, you know, you can spend lots of money as a philanthropist. You, corporations tend to be more narrow. In government, the opportunity to really generate change um, and see it ripple under the right conditions is unlike anything else. On the other hand, as we talked about at the very beginning, you know, there are a lot of governments who don't do things in the sort of don't care what, what, you know, whether you're going to get reelected. Um, don't think about the long run. So that, that, that caveat of under the right conditions is really the, the most important thing to focus on. As we were coming in today, a chunk of Lexington Avenue was closed. The signal lights were out. Traffic was jammed on the side streets. And you were in that trying to get here. Did you flash for a moment on what a relief it was not to be on the hook for that? <laughs> No, my first response was, geez, this never would have happened in the Bloomberg administration. <laughs> Please thank Dan Docker. And I, I'd, I'd like to thank both Dan and Ray for a fantastic presentation. Ray, you were, you were fantastic. That was fun. So, so just a couple quick thank yous and then we'll get you out of here. First of all, I'd like to thank our staff at Alumni Relations and Development. You, they were a tour de force here. We had a lot of folks here. So please give them a big round of applause. They did a great job.
and on behalf and on behalf of the alumni board of governors i want to thank all of you for coming out setting a record uh for the greatest caucus in history and we hope to see many of you back in chicago next year uh when we'll break the record again um let me leave you with a parting thought and then an invitation uh it marks uh the 25th year since i was admitted to the university of chicago i was in uh, that group of people that made it in 25 years ago i never would have gotten in now um and I remember being really excited to, being able to be able to join a world-class institution like the University of Chicago. I was really excited. And one of the reasons I was excited was because I was promised something by the admissions office. They put uh, their, uh, their materials on, on in paper, no online at the time, right, before the internet. And they promised me something that I remember today. It was a considerable adventure. That was the quote that they used. And they, of course, were absolutely right. Um, I, actually, I absolutely got that. Uh, considerable adventure and to my surprise that considerable adventure goes on to this day and I think we all learned today uh, based on uh, everything we've heard is that considerable adventure is going to con continue over the next five years and well beyond and I look forward to sharing that adventure with all of you uh, in the coming years so uh, let's adjourn to the uh, to the hotel bar I understand there's some complimentary drinks and appetizers compliments of Damon and Ken uh, so we'll see you at the hotel bar Thank you.